Hello there, welcome back. Um, so this is the beginning of unit two of the course where we move from talking about logic in mostly informal terms, that is using a natural language like English, to um, doing logic mainly using formal notation or symbolic notation. So in this week we're going to learn how to translate from um, English sentences to this symbolic notation that we'll be using. Okay, so why do we use symbols anyway when analyzing logic? Um, one way to think about it, or to understand the motivation for using symbolic notation, is to recognize that logic is concerned with patterns of good versus bad reasoning. So when we study validity, for example, we're not really interested in the subject matter of the argument. That is, whether the premises of the argument are in fact true or false. We're really just interested in whether the premises and the conclusion have that interesting connection between them that we've called um, entailment. So in that sense, the actual subject matter of an argument, whether it's about um, you know, an election or um, religion or what have you, it's totally irrelevant from the point of view of logic. So it turns out that we can just replace all of the individual sentences in an argument with symbols or variables that stand in for those sentences and then study the pattern of reasoning in a more you know, abstract and precise manner. So in general, using formal notation and definitions allows us to identify validity in a much more rigorous way, as we'll see in uh, the coming weeks. So that's part of the motivation as to why we use symbolic notation in logic. So first we have to learn how to actually translate a sentence or a set of sentences from English into symbolic logic. So the first thing to note is that sentences can actually be parts of other sentences. So a sentence can have another sentence as a part. So let's look at this example. First we have the sentence, whales are mammals. And number two says whales are mammals and humans are mammals. Okay, um, so the important thing to note here is that sentence one actually appears inside, so to speak, of sentence two. That is, sentence two contains sentence one as a part. All right, you can think of sentence two as basically two sentences, whales are mammals on the one hand, and humans are mammals on the other hand, and those two sentences are the two parts and and is you know kind of combining those two parts. So that's how we're going to be thinking about it uh, when we do our um, translations and analysis. So um, so yeah, so we think of sentence two basically as a complex sentence that has these two other sentences as parts, and we say that they're joined by and, which we're going to be calling a connective. So so, so words like and and or we will call um, connectives, um, or operators, as you'll see um, very shortly. So you can notice that the same kind of thing occurs with or. Right? Sentence, uh, sentence two, whales are mammals or birds can fly, actually has the sentence whales are mammals again as a part. Okay? So basically, you should basically uh, recognize that some sentences don't have other sentences as parts, and other sentences do. So what can we make of this fact? We'll see. Um, what about sentence one? Does it have any other sentences as parts? Um, no, it's just a simple basic sentence. So sentence one, we'll say, is an atomic sentence because it can't really be broken down any further into other sentences. And sentence two, we'll say, is a complex sentence. Um, which is a sentence which does have another sentence as a part. Uh, an atomic sentence, intuitively, you can think of it as a sentence which represents one simple fact. It states one thing. Right? Whereas intuitively, sentence two kind of states two facts, or has to do with two different um, propositions or facts, let's say. So intuitively, that's a good way to think about the distinction between atomic and complex sentences, but the strict way to define this would probably be just to say that a complex sentence is a sentence that has another sentence as a part. All right. So when we translate from English into formal logic, um, here you have characterization of atomic and complex sentences. 
Um, so when we translate from English into symbolic notation, the way we do it is we go through the passage and identify all of the atomic sentences first. So look for all of the sentences that can't be broken down any further. Then for each of these atomic sentences, we assign it a random variable. Um, by convention, we often use variables like P and Q and R and so on, but it can be any variable. Um, if, it's this, if the same sentence that, however, appears more than once, it should be replaced by the same variable um, each time. So for instance, if I have a sentence like, all birds can fly, and that same sentence appears multiple times throughout a paragraph, then I have to use the same letter everywhere that that sentence appears. Okay, so different sentences get different um, variables or propositional um, letters, and the same sentence will get the same letter if it's repeated. Okay, um, so let's see if we can apply this and see how it works uh, in action, so to speak. So let's take a look at this argument. Um, sentence one, Alice is tall or Bob is short. Sentence two, Alice is not tall. And the conclusion, therefore, Bob is short. Okay, so first thing we do, let's see, identify all the atomic sentences. Okay, so here it's quite easy. In fact, the work has already been done for us, but you can see here that there's two sentences listed at the top. Alice is tall and Bob is short. And each of these are given next to the letter that corresponds to them. So when you're doing a translation, you also have to give uh, a key which maps the variables that you're using to the actual sentence that they're standing in for. Okay, so um, if you look at sentence one, you can recognize that it is actually a complex sentence. Right? Alice is tall or Bob is short. That is a sentence which has other sentences as parts because Alice is tall is a sentence and Bob is short is a sentence. So sentence one is going to be a complex uh, proposition. So its parts, let's say, are on the left side, Alice is tall, and on the right side, Bob is short. So let's think about Alice is tall. Is that an atomic sentence or a complex sentence? Well, can it be broken down any further? It doesn't really seem like it. Right? Alice is tall just states one um, singular fact, and it doesn't seem to, to contain any, any other sentences as parts. So it seems like this is one of our atomic sentences, and Bob is short, the same thing would apply to that. So in this translation, we have two atomic sentences, and we give them different variables, P for Alice is tall, and Q for Bob is short. Okay, so now we go through and translate each line. So in line one, replace the first part with P, Alice is tall becomes P, and we just have the, uh, we place the second part, Bob is short, with Q, right? So what we're left with is P or Q. Okay, that's some progress, at least, towards uh, getting to a symbolic translation. Okay, so what about line two? Alice is not tall. Is this simple or complex? Well, if you think about it, Alice is not tall is kind of like taking Alice is tall and negating it, right? So Alice is tall actually is an atomic sentence. And so even though we're not really combining two sentences together to form sentence two, we're still taking an atomic sentence, which is Alice is tall, and doing something to it to transform it. So in other words, Alice is not tall, even though it doesn't have the same kind of flavor as the other examples of complex sentences, we are going to think of that as a complex sentence as well, where it has only one part, so to speak, which is P, and it forms a new sentence by taking P and negating it, right, saying not P. Okay, so you can see, if you put it in this kind of terms, that not P actually has P as a part. So that's how we're going to think about not. Um, in English, negation and not often appear 
in anywhere in a sentence really you know it can appear kind of in unpredictable um, places so you have to kind of think about your intuition about what the sentence means um, and when we do the translation we'll always put the negation out in front so things are quite clear okay so hopefully you can see that Alice is not tall actually becomes not Alice is tall so that's how we're going to think about sentences like two okay um, you can also think about negation as like saying it's not the case that right because that's a way of saying negation that goes in the front of the sentence so Alice is not tall is pretty much equivalent to it's not the case that Alice is tall so that's kind of closer to what we are seeing here not P it's not the case that Alice is tall okay so finally for line three therefore Bob is short well, we have Bob is short, that's Q. So do we need to do anything else? Well, no. In this case, therefore, actually isn't really adding anything to the, um, the logical argument itself, right? If you recall, therefore is an indicator word. So um, it's a word in English which keys you into the logical structure of uh, whatever you're reading. However, it doesn't actually add anything in itself to the argument. Um, so we can just basically leave it out when we're doing our translation. Okay, uh, let's take a look at another sentence for practice. So consider this sentence. If all whales are mammals and Willie is a whale, then Willie is a mammal. So this sentence is actually doubly complex um, and it has three atomic sentences as parts. Right? One all whales are mammals. That seems like that is in itself a atomic sentence. Um, also, Willie is a whale. That too is a sentence. That states, you know, a fact on its own. Willie is a whale. So we can sort of break that off into its own piece. And also the statement Willie is a mammal. That also is a atomic sentence um, that is a part of this more complex sentence. So you can see we have these three parts here, P, Q, and R, and we've given the key so that when we do the translation uh, it's you know easy to tell um, what the variables mean. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, let's take a look at this. Um, we have all whales, whales are mammals, so the first thing we do we just go ahead and replace the atomic sentences with their variables. So if all whales are mammals becomes if P and Willie is a whale, that's Q. So this whole thing be becomes if P and Q. If P and Q. Then Willie is a mammal. So that's R. So the whole thing becomes if P and Q, then R. Okay? So this is a, a slightly more complex sentence than the previous case. And you can see here that this first part itself is also complex. So a complex sentence might have uh, it, it might have many different connectives. So it might have many sentences as parts, not just two. Um, if it does, then it will have to be broken down even further. Okay. So as you can see, when we do this um, translation process, we replace all the English uh, words with random variables, except for certain words like and or, not, if, then, and so on. So these words have special importance in logic. So we have special symbols for them. So here you can see a table of the symbols that we'll be using for the main uh, logical connectives. And also be aware that other sources or texts might use um, other symbols for some of these. Uh, so this is relatively straightforward. Um, for the most part, although it's easy to get confused about all the different forms of um, the if then. So first we have if P then Q, which is P and then the arrow going to Q. So that's if P then Q. Um, and it's often helpful to think about the arrow as sort of going from P to Q, at least that helps me. So notice that if P then Q is actually the reverse, so to speak, of P if Q. All right, so we'll 
can we can talk a little bit about um, what the motivation for these translations are. Um, but if you don't have strong intuitions about uh, what P if Q you know means, then it's quite helpful as well to just memorize these basic forms because ultimately there's not that many of them, um, and it is quite easy to get tripped up if you just rely on your intuition. So um, the way I remember this is you have if P then Q is the basic form, right, which is P going to Q. Then you have P if Q, which you re should recall is kind of the reverse form. So with P if Q, you have the arrow going from Q to P, going from the right side to the left side. One way you might be able to remember this is you have if Q, you have P and then if Q. So in this case, the thing that comes after if is the left-hand side. And that's also the case here, right? If P, and P is the left-hand side. Here it says if Q, and Q is the left-hand side. Now that rule is broken once you get to this statement or this um, expression, but at least maybe this will help you remember this form. So when you get to P only if Q, basically you just have to remember that this is exactly like if P then Q. So if P then Q and P only if Q go together, they have exactly the same meaning, and P if Q is the kind of weird one that you have to look out for where the uh, arguments are reversed. Okay, then you have um, P if and only if Q is very important and common, and here you'll see the double arrow notation. And this one should be somewhat intuitive because it is literally P if Q, which is the arrow going from Q to P, and P only if Q, which is the arrow going from P to Q. So P if and only if Q is literally P if Q and P only if Q. So we already have translation for P if Q and for P only if Q. So you can see that this expression kind of combines these two and the arrow actually points in both directions. Okay, um, and then finally P unless Q is again a kind of a strange one, but um, the important thing to remember is that if uh, it's negation of the right hand side then going to the left hand side. So P unless Q intuitively it kind of means like if Q doesn't happen then P happens. Right? P unless Q means, well, unless Q happens, if Q doesn't happen, then P will happen. So that's, that's maybe one way to get your intuition around these um, forms. But in any case, this is uh, it's a relatively small list, so it's definitely worth just taking the time um, to memorize some of those tricky ones, and um, hopefully the rest are straightforward. Okay, so let's just take another look at previous example and finish the complete translation to symbolic notation. So we had P or Q. So in order to um, you know, fully translate this into symbols, we want to replace the or with the sign for or, which is this V sign, right? P or Q becomes P V Q. So yeah, right here, P or Q becomes P and the sign for or, and then Q. Okay. Um, then in sentence two, not P, we take the sign for not, which is this tilde or squiggly line thingy, and um, we put that in front of the proposition P, and that's it. You're done. And then Q is already, um, well, it doesn't have any other words that need to be translated. So that's already done. Okay, so those are the basic principles behind translating from symbolic notation to English.